Jesus pursues us. Jesus longs for us. He wants to be in a relationship with you. He will never give up. He will never run out. He will never leave nor forsake. And He will not stop pursuing you. Many of you, your thoughts and your head, your plans are already gearing towards what will happen on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, when it's a holiday. Tama po ba? We're upcoming to the Holy Week, right? And much of our tradition, especially in the Philippines, is the Holy Week with, filled with rituals, plans, filled with vacations and whatnot. But when we come to the real essence of Holy Week, it is not what we can do in this week that matters. It is what God has done for us. And that is why this Holy Week has also been called the Passion Week. Everyone say passion. What does that mean? Passion from the Latin is pasio or patir. It means in Greek, pathos. And what does this word mean? The world today will call passion as something that's emotional, something that's driven by your sensual desire or attraction. If you're passionate about something, maybe it's your hobby or interest. But when we understand the real core of passion, it is this. It is suffering. It is enduring. It is going to that great extent to fulfill a calling. That is the passion. And we are going to be talking about the love that is passionate for today. And we see that in the life of Jesus. So for our time here today, I've circled and enlightened all of this message to have three points. And it is this. Jesus pursues us. Everyone repeat after me. Jesus pursues us. Second point is Jesus proclaims truth. Can we repeat that? Jesus proclaims truth. And thirdly, Jesus personifies that love. And as we come into this message, let's prepare our hearts. Na hindi lang po puro bakasyon ng Holy Week. But for us to rediscover the actual passion of Christ, what He did on that last week before His eventual death. Let's go with the first point. For love to be passionate, it is a pursuing love. That's why we have to understand that Jesus pursues us. It is no accident that you are here today. Today of all days. Today is also called in church tradition, Palm Sunday. Tama po ba? Many of you might have seen on the road today, coming here, people waving, having those branches. And there's something there because that is what we find in the scriptures. We actually see the triumphal entry of Jesus as he goes into Jerusalem. This occasion was narrated by all four gospel writers. And we see here that Jesus enters into Jerusalem. He is determined to go to Jerusalem. He is purposeful, intentional to go to this city, even though they receive him with mixed reactions. He says in John 12, verses 12 to 15, the large crowd who had come to the feast, what feast is this? This is the Passover feast. This is the feast that was yearly attended by all Jewish people. They had to go to Jerusalem for this feast to celebrate the Passover lamb. And when they had come to this feast, they were wondering if Jesus would go. Okay? And when they had heard that Jesus was indeed coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of the palm trees, which was the national tree of Israel, and they went out to meet him and began to shout. What did they shout? How did they welcome Jesus? Let's all read this together. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. What does Hosanna mean? Hosanna means, oh, save us. Hosanna means, oh, come and rescue us. So we get here a clue that these people quoted Psalm 118, this very line from the Old Testament. And they welcomed him and said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. They expected him, Jesus, to be the Messiah. But in some of them, they were thinking this Messiah would be the one to set us free, 
Not from our sin, not from death, but from our oppressors. Sino po yun? The Roman Empire. Most of them had the idea that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem to overthrow the actual Roman government. They had him not as a spiritual Messiah, Savior. They had him as a political Messiah who would come to set them free from their captivity. And that's why Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it. And as it is written, he fulfilled the scripture that says, Fear not, daughter of Zion, or another title for Israel. He says, let's all read this together. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Now again, when the earlier audience would have read this, they would have been surprised. Bakit po? Jesus, as the king, as the Messiah, comes into Jerusalem not on a mighty horse, not on a mighty stallion or a chariot. He comes in humbly on a donkey, a lowly beast of labor. That is unfitting for a king. In other words, if we have uh, uh, any political leader, the president or anyone who comes in on a tricycle, you would be shocked instead of the usual several cars. If your king came to you on the donkey, how would you feel? Jesus says, behold, your king is coming. He has come to set himself as their Messiah in Jerusalem. And this reminds us that even today, Jesus comes into our very lives in order to invite us into a relationship with him. Jesus has set his eyes on you and he passionately pursues you no matter how far you've run away or how unworthy you feel. In fact, when Jesus enters into Jerusalem, he weeps because he knows how the rest of the people will respond to him. Right now, some of them are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But in just a few days' time, some of these very people will be shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And sometimes we are like that too. When we welcome Jesus when it's hard, when we're in a difficult spot, and then when everything gets resolved, okay, thank you, Jesus, bye-bye. So you have to understand, folks, Jesus pursues us. Jesus longs for us. He wants to be in a relationship with you. And that is why in John 15, 15, 16, he says, No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know his, what his master is doing, but I have called you what? Friends. He has come and offered friendship with you and with me. He pursues us for this sake. And he says in verse 16, let's all read this together. You did not choose me, but I chose you. God has set his eye on you. God has selected you. God has pursued you relentlessly. Pakisabi po sa katabi niyo, God has chosen you. He will never give up. He will never run out. He will never leave nor forsake. And he will not stop pursuing you. When we realize that Jesus pursues us, how do we respond? Do we respond willingly? Do we say, yes, Lord, come into my life? Or do we reject him? Or are we fearful of the repercussions? Look at this, John 12, verse 41. Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, what? Believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they were not confessing him publicly, openly, for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved, let's all read this together, they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Is that you today, dear friend? You know that Jesus has relentlessly pursued you already, and yet you're afraid. You don't want to consider yourself a Christ follower for what your family might think. You don't want to come out as a Christian because of what your co-workers or your boss might think or what other people may say. Dear friends, I have realized this one thing and one thing only. 
that it is more important what God says of us rather than what people say of us. Can I get an amen? Mas mahalaga po ang salita ng Panginoon, what He says about us, rather than how other people view us. And once again, that is why He tells us, I have called you my friends. You know, I, I, I can remember the times in my life, even before I became a Christian, that I was filthy and dirty, that I was literally in my own vomit because I had been so drunk and wasted the night before. And I remember in those moments or pockets of clarity, I would ask somewhere out there if there was a God who was real, would he love even me, a filthy, wretched person? And that is what I discovered. That is when God was pursuing me, even at that point in time, that God would actually speak to someone close to me, my brother, who then was invited to a Bible study and he became a Christian. We had the same past life and yet he experienced the love of Christ. My brother then goes to my mom and goes to my mom and then invites her again. And my mom becomes a Christ follower as well. And when that point came, ako dalawa na sila, wala na akong takas. And I remember they would invite me again and again, come with us to CCF, join the service. Yeah? And I would go not because of them. I would go because after the service, there was dinner. Free dinner. Sagot po nila. So I would sit through the service. I wouldn't listen to the pastor. I would just sleep at the very back. But I knew then God was getting my attention. God was reaching out to me, pursuing me as he is to you today. Not only are we chosen and pursued by God despite of us, we are invited into a loving friendship with him. So pause and ponder right now, dear friends. Take this time to reflect and apply this point. What are you pursuing today? Are you so busy and preoccupied with life, with your plans, with your own agenda, with your own interests, that you forget that Jesus is already pursuing you? How are you responding to Jesus' pursuit of you? Are you receptive? Are you open? Are you allowing him to embrace you, to woo you to himself, to draw you to himself? Or are you hardening your heart? Are you saying, no, 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 no. I don't want any part of this. No, 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 ayoko. Dear friends, remember, Jesus is pursuing you. And as he comes into Jerusalem, the very second thing that he does is he proclaims the truth. Everyone say this with me. Jesus proclaims the truth. When he enters into Jerusalem, the first stop that he goes to is the temple. And we see this very controversial picture of Jesus. Why? When he goes into the temple, he sees there are many resellers, many people offering various animals for the pilgrimage. You see, in those days, the people would travel from distant lands. And once they get there, they needed animals to sacrifice. So what they do is they buy from these sellers. And what these sellers would do was sell them at exorbitant prices, triple, quadruple the price. They had made it into a place of business, into a place of money-making. No wonder Jesus, when he entered in, began to drive out those who were selling and saying, he quoted, look at this scripture again, to proclaim the truth. Let's all read this. And my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a robber's den. He overturns the tables. He flips all of those resellers in the temple. He cleanses out the temple and he proclaims the truth. This temple, this place is for prayer. 
And oftentimes, this is what Jesus does. He overturns certain things in our lives, certain idols that we may have, certain preoccupations that we have held dear to our hearts. When He enters into our lives, when He pursues us, the second thing that He does is He upholds the truth of God in our lives over these other pursuits, over these other things that we place our satisfaction in or we find ourselves busy in. Are you hanging on to the very truth of God? Are you as passionate about His Word? Are you reading this Word? Are you saturating yourself in this word? Do you read it daily? Do you read it and memorize it and internalize it in your heart? That is what Jesus desires to do in the temple and in our lives. Maybe some of you started well when you first became Christians and where you first attended CCF, you were reading this book. Are you still reading it regularly and with the same passion? Maybe when you, were first, when you first became a Christ follower, you were so passionate about sharing the truth about God. Uy, alam mo, I need to share something with you. I need to tell you that God loves you. How has your evangelism been? Have you shared the gospel recently? Or have you waned in your passion? Have you grown cold in your love for God? Dear friend, if you find yourself in that situation, it's time to go back because Jesus passionately pursues us. He passionately upholds the very truth to us. Do we hold it dear? And that's why he says in John 15 verse 14, let's all read this together. You are my friends if you what? If you do what I command you. If you obey the word. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Whatever truth that was revealed from the Father to Jesus, He makes known to us. That is how we know that we are passionately loved by Jesus. He bears the truth upon us. And when we passionately heed God's word, it turns our lives around and it changes us forever. You see, later on in that week, Jesus goes to his disciples and one of the things that he emphasizes to them is found in John 14. He tells this to his disciples, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. Not only do we have the truth of God's word, we also have the spirit of truth. This is the Holy Spirit whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you, disciples, friends, you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Jesus reiterates to them, you will not be able to do this on your own. And that is why I will send the Holy Spirit to be your guide. He actually says, it is better for me that I should go so that I can send the Holy Spirit your way. And later on in verse 25, he says this, these things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the helper, let's all read this, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will what? He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Dear friends, we need the power of the Holy Spirit, yes? He will be the one to guide us in the truth. So much so that it's so timely when you need, when you need something from God, when you have a problem, when you have a challenge, right? Most of us will resort to what? Take out our phone and consult with Mr. Google. If we're just honest, talaga, right? When we have a problem or we don't know what to do, Google, Google it. Dear friends, what about this? We go first to God. We ask God, Lord, what do I do with this? Even the simple things, even the, the minimal things, the little things. What if we ask God first? That is the promise that Jesus tells us that the Spirit of God 
will be with us to grant us His power and the wisdom of God will be with us through His Word. And the result of that is verse 27. Let's all read this. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You see, whenever you're afraid, whenever you're anxious, whenever you're worried, whenever you're disturbed, burdened, go to God. Go to His Word. Open your Bible. Kahit na napakatagal na, start opening and reading the Scripture. And the Holy Spirit will work to renew your mind and to renew your heart. That is how we rediscover His love for us. That is how we experience the passionate love of God. And our third point and final point for today is this. That Jesus personifies love. Can everyone say this with me? Jesus personifies love. It is a love that is embodied. A love that is modeled by Jesus himself. In John 13, we get a glimpse of this love of Jesus. Before the feast of the Passover, before he shares in that meal, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come and that he would depart out of this world to the Father. Look at this. Let's all read this together. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. In his last final hours, before he is eventually betrayed, he is eventually abandoned, denied, and left behind, he loved his disciples to the end. And he got up from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and he girded himself with that towel and he poured water into a basin and began to what? He began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Dear friends, if you know the background, the context of this, feet washing was customary in their time. Bakit? They had no paved roads. They walked on sandy, stony roads. And apart from that, they did not have closed shoes. They only wore sandals. And so you can imagine how dirty the feet of one's guests may be. And usually, this act of washing the feet was reserved for the lowest of the low slaves, the lowest ranking person in that household. It was that person's job to wash and clean the feet of the guests. And they would have probably been shocked when Jesus started washing their feet. Why? Did you know that they were busy? What were the disciples busy with? They were busy discussing who among them was the, the greatest. So they were probably waiting. Oh, sino na yung dito yung pinaka low sa atin? Ikaw na yung maghugas ng paa. Ikaw na yung maghugas. You're the lowest. We're the greatest. Right? But Jesus stoops in. He does the lowliest. Reserved for the least. He washes the disciples' feet. No matter how dirty it was. No matter how stinky it was. I'm sure meron na pong kachichas noon. I'm sure that that was part of it. To wash the feet of the disciples. To showcase His love for them. And that is why he says, when he had washed their feet and he had taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, that is right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Verse 15, let's all read this. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them.
You know, it is my privilege as a pastor and as a burden of mine, a passion of mine, to talk and engage the marketplace in the workplace. So it's by this humble privilege that God sends me to these places of work to share his gospel. One of which I was invited recently in BGC as we have a church plant in CCF BGC going on. And one of them invited me to this Bible study to share. This was the very first time that they were doing this in their company. And when I got there, I asked once again, so how did this Bible study happen? Who arranged this? And it was the guy who invited me. And one of them said, oh, it's because of Kuya. Kuya was the one who initiated this. And actually, Kuya was the one who shared the gospel with me. Oh, and I said, oh, oh, why? It's because this brother was actually the company driver of that business. And so whenever he would have passengers in the car, what would he do? He would share Jesus to them. They had no choice because they needed to go to their appointment and to ride the company car. And it just so happened that he was the one used by God. And what blessed me so much was this person who attended the Bible studies. He, uh, this person told me, Kuya did not just share the gospel with me. But for the next two years after he did, he discipled me every week. That is love. That is passionate love. Doesn't matter your rank. Doesn't matter your status. Doesn't matter where you're at. God can use you to exemplify his love. If he can use a company driver, he can use you. Another Bible study Actually, Bible team building to a company that I was invited in last year was this company that I was so pleasantly surprised because when I got there, they were having three days worth of a company team building. And usually, you know, it's just one session for the gospel. But this, I was surprised because all of the sessions in their team building was with speakers whom they invited from where? From CCF. Nagulat ako, wow. They did their company team building. All of the topics were about God and His love. Isn't that amazing? And, and so, I was so blessed. And I, th- and I asked the business owner, uh, the CEO, so, so why? What brought this about? And, and that, this person told me, we are all just passing through. And I want to pass on to my employees the most valuable thing. The love of God. You know what's more than those three days on their way back home on Sunday? They would have a a stopover. You guess where that stopover is? CCF Sunday service. (laughs) They brought him here. Whoever was willing, whoever had free time, go and attend the service together. Isn't God amazing? Yes, let's praise God. God can use anybody if you are willing and if you have discovered that love of Christ. Again, Jesus says in verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. This command, I give to you that you love one another. I honestly believe, dear friends, that if we live for God, if we seek first His kingdom and we share His love to people, when we pray for His support, when we pray for His grace, when we pray for His provision or His protection, He will answer it. So long as we are aligned to His mission. Amen? Amen, church? And after washing the feet of the disciples, this is what He did. He found Himself in that garden of Gethsemane. And in that garden, he wept again. He was agonizing. Because he knew any moment now, they would come for him. And this was his prayer. He knelt down and began to say, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. And yet he knew this is the purpose for which he came. 
And that's why he said, Yet not my will, but yours be done. What follows after is the worst. Jesus is betrayed by his closest. He is denied. All of the disciples scatter and abandon him. He is given a mock trial at night, which was illegal because there were no legit witnesses. He was punched, spat at, mocked, and he was given a criminal, criminal's trial with no due process. And they even stripped him of his clothes, of his robes, and placed upon him a purple robe to mock him that he was the king of the Jews. And what's worse is they crowned him with a crown of thorns that would have punctured his very skull, that would have went into his very head, inches in with thorns. And once they handed him over to the Romans, the Romans then gave in to the cry of the people to crucify this Messiah whom earlier they had just welcomed. And once they did, they did not stop there. They actually had him scourged, whipped with a whip that was filled with bones and stones and sharp thorns all twisted together. And they whipped him 39 lashes on the back to the point that his back would be bloodied and bruised. And they stopped at 39 because if you reach 40, that would entail death. And even as bad as that was, they gave him his platitula, the beam, that he is to carry for miles and miles to his execution site on Golgotha, the place of the skull. And on that cross, that wooden thing, they pierced him as Isaiah 53 prophesied. They pierced Jesus on his hands on that cross with his feet on top of one another for our sake. They crucified him who is the son of God. They crucified the very savior that was sent for us. And if you knew just how hard that was, if you've ever been crucified, it is a very difficult, torturous position. Why? You are constantly hanging by the weight of your entire body by your hands. And what that does is that squeezes your chest that you cannot breathe properly. So for you to get a breath, you need to pull yourself up. <gasps> and then you prop yourself back down because of the fatigue, because of the immense weight and the struggle and the bleeding. Jesus was already nearly dead on that cross. And yet this is what he was doing. When they came to that place, they crucified him between two criminals, one on the right, the other on the left. Jesus, with every breath that he could muster from his lungs, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. As he hung on that cross, he's still praying for mercy upon these people. He is crucified between two criminals. And even on that, look at this, Luke 23 says, one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling insults, abuse at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other one answered and rebuked the guy and said, do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, are we indeed suffering justly? We're receiving what we deserve for our deeds. And yet he says to Jesus, this man has done nothing wrong. He knows who Jesus is. And later on he says, and he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. He shows faith. He knows Jesus. And he places his very life upon this man on the cross next to him. And what does Jesus say in response to him? 
Does Jesus say, Sige, ayusin mo muna yung buhay mo. Does Jesus tell him, yeah, do some good works first. Or, 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 or get baptized first. Or, or, or get down from that cross and go belong to a church first. No, no, no. Jesus says, again, with every breath that is counted, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Promises him assurance. Promises him that he will be welcomed into eternity. That is how Christ personified love in his ultimate sacrifice on the cross. We need only to believe in him and he will carry us into paradise. How many of you believe this today? Dear friends, this is the greatest news that you could ever have, the greatest love that you could ever experience. At the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. This was about 3 p.m. He cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's at this point that the son was forsaken for our sake. That on that cross, that cursed tree, the father turned his face away from the son. And in that moment, Jesus paid for all our sins through his passion and death. That is the true example of his passionate love for us. A love that endures, a love that suffers, a love that fulfills its calling, its purpose. And he speaks, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last. Pause and ponder as we wind down in our time today. How have we truly embraced Jesus' love as the basis for our lives? Have you fully experienced the extent of his love? What is hindering me from loving like Jesus? You see, love is passionate, dear friends. Why? Because Jesus showed his passion on that cross, on that final week that he pursues us, that he proclaims the truth to us, and that he personifies that very same love to us. The question is, have we received that love today? So I want to give everyone here right now at this very moment a chance to make it right, a chance to receive him, to be in a loving friendship with Jesus. Because he has chosen you this day and he longs to be with you. So let us bow our heads and together join our hearts in this prayer. That if you today realize that you've been living on your own terms and that you realize that you are a sinner and you need a savior, I would like to pray with you and for you that today you would be reconciled with God, that today you would experience His love which was poured out for you on the cross, that He would lead you to Himself right at this very moment. If today you want to do that, dear friend, can you just raise your hand with every head bowed down in this place? It's just between you and God. I want to pray with you and for you. And if you've never surrendered your life to Him as your Lord and Savior, today would be that day that you would acknowledge Him, that you would publicly confess Him as your Master and King. I see those hands raised. Praise God. Please don't harden your heart at this moment, but open your heart to Jesus. And right now, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, you see every hand raised here. But more importantly, you see every heart. You know who we are 
and what we have done. And yet your love for us is so passionate that you have pursued us this day, that you have proclaimed the truth, the gospel, that we are saved by your grace. Oh, such amazing grace that you loved us and you laid down your life for your friends. So today, pray with me something like this from your own words in your own heart. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Make me into a new person. I ask for forgiveness for all of my sins. And I turn away from my past in order to live with you and for you for the rest of my life. I surrender myself to you, Lord Jesus. At the foot of your cross, I come. I receive your gift of eternal life today. In all of these things I pray, in Jesus' beautiful and powerful name, amen.